Good morning. Good morning to all, whether you're here in church with us this morning or watching in YouTube at home, all are welcome. Another welcome this morning is to our own minister, Matthew, who's back amongst us, thankfully, and uh, we're looking forward to what we can achieve together in the weeks ahead. An official intimation that must be read this week and next week is the fact that the annual stated meeting of the church will be held on Sunday the 28th of April here in church at 12.30. Copies of the accounts for last year will be available next Sunday on the book board for anyone who's interested. And the last thing of note is the Saturday lunch club. They desperately need some volunteers, not every single Saturday, but there are particular Saturdays where they are in need of help. And it's the second Sunday in the month especially. Any, sorry, second Saturday in the month, but any Saturday would do. If you've got an hour or two free, please go along. You'll be made most welcome and you can help out in the efforts of something that's very important to the church here in Nielsen, but also important to the community. So that's the lunch club. Second Saturday in the month. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you and uh, good morning. Um, I cannot tell you how good it is to be back amongst you. Um, it has been far too many weeks since I have last joined in worship with you. I wanted to just take the opportunity whilst I was here um, just to say thank you. To everyone who reached out over that time with a card or flowers for all the prayers that I've received from all of you, you cannot know how much they mean to me. And also to say thank you to all those who've um, basically been doing my job whilst I've been at home. Um, thank you to Jim and Robert, thank you to John and Maureen, uh, thank you to Tim down the road and everyone else who has stepped in, done things they wouldn't normally do, covered Sundays or just had a lot of extra work over this last seven weeks. Um, thank you. It's appreciated. Um, and your building of God's kingdom is known. As we come to worship this morning, we do so in a morning of improved weather. Um, we do so in a morning where we come together in gladness of community and in the spirit. So it's only fitting that we start off our worship singing a, a song of the Lord's goodness. Uh, singing a song of what God has done. So um, we're going to sing number 157 in, if you're using one of our purple hymn books, 157. But the words will be on the screen as usual. Sing of the Lord's goodness.
here. One, two. One, two. Yeah, no, it's there. It's got it. Um, that looks fine. That's fine. We're connected. We are plugged in. Oh, hang on. That's why. We're down. There we go. Hello. My microphone's working now. For anyone who missed what I said at the beginning, hello. Um, let us now approach God in prayer. Uh, at the conclusion of this prayer, we're going to be saying the Lord's Prayer, the words which will be on the screen. Let us pray. <coughs> Our Lord, we praise you in the morning. When we awake to a great, grand new day, whatever the weather, whatever it has in store, the new day is always a miracle. So we praise you in the morning. Our Lord, we praise you in the evening for a day that has happened, for the promise of a day that is to come, for your presence with us, which is eternal and constant. Our Lord, we praise you throughout the day in whatever we are doing, wherever we are, whether it is things that bring us joy or despair, we praise you as you are there and with us. Our Lord, we praise you at night but as we sleep, we are held by you. Our Lord, we praise you at all times and in all ways that we are capable of, for you are great, the creator of all, the Lord of life, the God of light, the forgiver of sins, the saviour of the world. Our Lord, you deserve so much. So we thank you for what you have done for us, for those miracles, large and small, for those mercies poured out to us day upon day. Our Lord, for all of it, we thank you. We know that our God, you deserve so much. You deserve us to do our best, but we don't always. There are times when we, there are times in which we are not our best, in which we do not reflect your glory, in which we do not do the things that we ought to. Times in which we sin against you or each other. Our Lord, for these times we are sorry. We know it was not good enough. And we know it should not have happened. Our Lord, we thank you that no matter our sins, there is forgiveness in you. That when we mess up and we ask you for forgiveness, it is always given not because you have to or because we deserve it, but because of your great love for us. So our Lord, we pray that you will be with us, with your forgiving spirit upon us. Quiet in our hearts, O Lord, so that we may hear your word, that we may hear your promises and we may discern your message for our lives. Lord, as we think upon your Son and talk about his ministry, we remember the words that God said, a prayer that we share together as we say, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation 
but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Um, I want to tell you guys just a wee story, if it's okay, about one of the things I've done since I last saw you. Um, one of the things I've done is had to um, make a, a, a small repair um, to the grouting in my bathroom floor. It's just been a small thing where it's been chipped away. So I decided, well, I know the product I need, so I'm going to go out and I'm going to get it. So I went out to um, local news agents, because they sell tools and stuff, and I said, do you have the product I need? They said, no, that's no problem, I'll go down to Barhead, because the shops there will definitely have it. And they said, no. So I thought to myself, where do I need to go to find this? B and Q. So I went to B&Q at Darnley, because they sell everything. You can basically build a house with what you can find there. So I went in, and I found a member of staff, and I said, this is what I want. I'm sure you've got it. And they said, no. I know exactly what you mean. We just don't sell it. So I thought, okay. I'll have to go online and order it, won't I? So I went online, and bah, I, I don't know. I'm going through a bit of a phase right now where I'd rather buy something in an actual shop than go online, unless it's like a lot cheaper on Amazon. And I thought, I'm seeing someone in a couple of days. I'll be in town. I'll get it there. Nope. At this time, it was becoming really annoying. Everywhere I looked, they knew exactly what I needed, but they didn't have it themselves. Well, I struck gold. I was randomly in a shop and found exactly the exact brand that I was looking for, the exact product I needed, and in the really small pack, which is all I needed, and for a reasonable price as well. It was farm foods. If anyone can tell me why they had that when B&Q didn't, when the hardware shops didn't, and where no one else does, you're smarter than me. I don't know. No idea. It was the most random thing. But I did get what I wanted. But it, it got me thinking a wee bit about where we might go to look for things. So, for instance, if I was looking for... A new book. Let's say I was looking for um, one of the new, one of the new books, the new Dav Pilkey book. The, the, he's quite popular. Where might I go to find that book so that I could read it? I don't know, guys. Where, where might I be able to go? The library. The library? Yeah. <laughs> the library might have it. Where Where else might have? The, new book. the bookshop. Yeah, I could go into Watterson's, couldn't I? Absolutely. Big shops tend to have books. Asda has them. Tesco has them, don't they? Yeah. Watterson, uh, um, I could go to Watterson's in town. So yeah, if I'm looking for a book, I could go to a bookshop. Do that. What about, I was looking the other day for something. I was looking for a soft toy penguin. I don't know, can anyone think, where might I go to find a soft toy penguin? Your room. Excellent, yes, Lyra. <laughs> I suspect, though, that if I went to your room and took them, you'd not be too pleased. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Lyra's room, anywhere else? No. Charity shop, charity shop. Always great for that, absolutely. But... Charity shops, you can get a lot of great stuff, but you can't always rely that they'll have the thing you need. Anywhere else I might go to get a soft toy penguin? Watersons might. A toy shop. A toy shop. Maybe the entertainer, maybe Hamleys, maybe like 
Lloyd Smith's, maybe, yeah. I could go to a toy shop. But what if I wasn't looking for a thing? What if I was looking for a person? Maybe I, I'm out and about and I want to find a policeman. <laughs> Where could I go to find a policeman, do you reckon? Yeah. Well, Find a crime. It's good, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I, I, sometimes in movies where they need to get the police really quickly, so they go out the door and fire a gun into the air because they know that they'll arrive really quick. I could do that. Or I could loot a shop. Yeah. Oh, someone else's crime. Some, someone else's crime, yeah. I could wait for a crime to happen, but... Let's imagine that there's not necessarily going to be a crime right there. Where else do we tend to find police hanging around? Police station. Absolutely. If there's a police station nearby, that would be a good place. Definitely find police there. Anywhere else that we tend to find them? McDonald's, donut shops. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Train station. You go to a big train station, guaranteed you're going to find a pile of policemen because that's where they hang out. So yeah, there's, there's a few places there. What about if I was looking, uh, what about if I was looking for healing? What happens if I was looking to be, I had a problem and I needed to be healed? Where might I go for that? Where might I look? I don't know. If I had like, I don't know, a bad back or a heart condition or something. Doctor, yeah, that would be a good shout. I could go to the GPs, I could go to the hospital, yeah. Uh, I, I could join a waiting list, yeah. Um, maybe a pharmacy? The pharmacist can help with some stuff, can't they? Yeah. Uh, minor injuries, yeah, absolutely. If you've like broken your thumb or something, minor injuries, that's the place to go. Um, yeah. So I think we've all got a reasonably good idea of where we go to find stuff. What about, though, if I was looking for Jesus, where might I go to find Jesus? Yes, Lyra. Uh, a church. Good yeah, shout. Yeah, it won't be actually there, but that's where you might find Jesus. Yeah. I think that's a good shout. A church would be a good place to find Jesus. I certainly hope if you came in here just now that that's something you would find. Is there anywhere else we might look? Anywhere? Everywhere? Okay, we're a bit broad. We're a bit broad. Have we got any more specific examples where we might find Jesus or see Jesus or experience Jesus? Yeah, come on. The sky, technically, technically, yes. In a prayer, yeah, technically. What, what about, do you think that we'd ever find Jesus, say, um, in a hospital? No? Mm -hmm. I, I think maybe... Maybe we, we might be able to, because there'll be chaplains there, won't there, in the hospital? Yeah, there will. Um, all NHS hospitals have chaplains, we'll be fine. Um, what about um, school? Might we find Jesus in the school? No? What about when I'm in school? Okay, we'll gloss over that. Um, I think the, the choir may be preempted to slightly. But Jesus, that's a slightly. Yeah, Jesus is maybe a slightly harder prospect. But we're going to be talking a little bit about places we might find Jesus. And the answer is that everywhere we would go to look for other people, other things, we can find Jesus. We can find Jesus in the places we expect, like in church. 
or in a chaplaincy centre or um, maybe round at a friend's house for a Bible study. But we can find Jesus in really unexpected places as well. We can find Jesus in Watersons, in B&Q, in a police station, in a train station. Because Jesus is everywhere. And being able to find Jesus in places we don't expect, as well as places we expect, is good. Yes, Lyra? Could he be in your house? Absolutely. He could even be in your bedroom. Yep. (laughs) Jesus could even be in your bathroom. Anywhere that you look, you can experience Jesus. Because Jesus is everywhere. So if we keep our eyes open and we keep our ears out, we can find Jesus in the most unexpected places. All we have to do is look and pray. Thinking about prayer, um, one way that we can pray is by singing hymns, can't we? Um, And so maybe that's what we should do now. And uh, whilst we're singing this, maybe let's keep our eyes and ears open to see if we can find Jesus in hymns as well. So it's number 721, 721, We Lay Our Broken World. First reading this morning comes from John's Gospel, John 5, reading from chapter 1. The healing at the pool. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, 
which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralysed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick up, to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Read again from John's Gospel, John chapter 9, reading from verse 1. Jesus heals a man born blind. 
As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Amen. May God add his blessing to these readings of his word. And we're going to sing again with hymn number 707, Healing River of the Spirit. Today, uh, we're looking at two stories from the Gospel of John, of John. Two stories that are, in a lot of ways, very similar. So much so that I think we might be able to recap them both together. In both, Jesus is in Jerusalem. And he goes to or near a pool and finds someone there who needs his help. In one case, they're blind. In the other, not completely sure, but they can't walk. Anyway, <laughs> Jesus does some stuff, and the person's healed. And then, there's a run-in with the authorities about it. It's basically the same story. 
Yeah, there are some minor differences, but at its core, and for our purposes today, they're more or less the same. Except for one really crucial detail, which is the one I want to talk about. <coughs> the location. Both of these take place in or around pools. Specifically, the pool of uh, Siloam and the pool of Bethesda. Now, the pool of Bethesda um, was, oh, there we go, it's up there, was near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem. It's in the north, um, just up kind of that corner where the black circle is. Some of you may have been there before. Um, if you've gone to Jerusalem, uh, it might have been an area that you stopped off at. Um, and you'll notice it looks a bit like that today. What we're seeing there is, is more the foundations of the churches that were built around it later, but that's where it is. It, at the time, though, was two pools. A pool with an upper reservoir to allow for the constant refreshment and purification of the lower which served as a mikveh or ritual cleaning bath. Although one might reasonably suspect that non-ritual washing may have taken there as well. An interesting side note is that the uh, text tells us that it had five covered buildings around it, meaning that it would be a five-sided pool, which for a long time led biblical scholars to decide that this was either artistic flair or didn't exist. Well, we found it, archaeologists dug it up, and there we go. It was two pools, so you can see how they get five buildings. Regardless, ritual cleaning was an important part of faith and life at the time. So pools were provided for that purpose. They often worked as well to provide irrigation, catch rainwater, but primarily they were there for ritual washing. Rules around spiritual purity, marriage, conversion to Judaism, and so forth, required at times immersion. There were quite a few mikvah around Jerusalem, but this one, the one at Bethesda, was different. It was special. This one would, at times, be stirred. There would be some kind of disturbance in the water. Um, we don't know exactly what or why, but it was very visible, clearly. And it was believed that it was, that, that was an angel entering the water. And further... Though when this happened, the first person to get into the water after would be healed of whatever it was that was wrong with them. I do wonder what the atmosphere around that must have been like. People waiting around the sides of the pool all day, hoping to be the first to see the stirring and hoping beyond hope that they'd be the first person in. The stampede of people when it did happen. The disappointment of those who weren't the first. I suspect it would be more galling when the first person in was someone who is a relatively healthy newcomer. Someone with an earache or a cold who fancied some healing and got in before those who'd been there for years. Especially since, without help, the most in lead were the least able to access the pool. There is a whole sermon here about how the most in need are often the least able to access it, and about the DWP and the Home Office, but I'll let you write that one for yourselves I'm going to say something slightly different. There's an idea of what it would have looked like. This is from a TV show recreation. 
but it's a good idea of what it might have looked like with that disturbing and with people trying to come down those steps to get in. It is into this context that we find our man lying at the side of the pool. He's been unable to walk for 38 years. And he'll never be able to reach the healing waters first. But Jesus tells him simply, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And the man is cured. Free to live his life, free to be part of society, healed, redeemed, restored. He's made whole at the place of healing. It's a story of someone being healed at a pool where people came to look for healing and people expected healing. Our other story is similar. Jesus has an interaction with a blind man. Now we presume that he was near or around the pool of Siloam. Um, there has come some discussion of sin, uh, but that's maybe for another day. The important part is that this man has been blind from birth. We don't know how long that is. Maybe it was 38 years. That would be poetic symmetry, but probably not. But instead of simply saying, get up, open your eyes and see, Jesus makes some mud, rubs it over the man's eyes, and he can see, and and rubs it over the man's eyes. Mud made, we should note, from the soil from the ground and Jesus' own spit, his own saliva. It's a bit gross, maybe. In fact, definitely. But it's a very literal contact between Jesus' spirit and the man's. Then Jesus tells him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. We're on the other end of the city for this one. Down almost at the south of the lower city in Jerusalem. Again, some of you may have visited this site. Feel free to tell me all about it. I haven't. But um, this is roughly what it looks like just now. Um, what, and it may have looked something like the smaller one on the right at the time. The pool of Bethesda was, and the pool of Siloam might look quite similar. They're both square, have steps. But they were very different in use. This one was not used for ritual washing, but was a reservoir. I suppose it was probably used for that purpose from time to time. But it was built as part of, effort, of efforts to secure Jerusalem's water supply. So although it was probably used for all manner of purposes, um, washing, cleaning, maybe even drawing water, it was primarily an irrigation and flow pool. It held for those in Jerusalem no particular significance. And it doesn't appear to have been much more than a practical part of city infrastructure. Of course, now it holds deep significance because of these events. But at the time, it didn't. But our man goes into the water. He bathes, he comes out, and he is cured. Two men cured next to or in pools one, a sacred healing space. The other, a very practical space. What's the difference between these two? Well, for the men concerned, none. They have an encounter with Jesus and they are healed. But for us, I think there's a bit more. Jesus approaches two people and heals them. But one is much more expected than the other. 
We live in a world in which healing is sorely, sorely needed. In which we have people who are unwell or people who are hurting or are grieving. We have a country that has never seemed more divided, certainly not in a long time. And we live in a world in which there appears to be ever greater instability and conflict. <coughs> Just this morning we have woken up, and if we've checked the news so far, we will know of drone strikes and missiles, warnings of escalation. We'll have learned about rises in casualty figures. We live in a world that needs healing. A world that needs wholeness and unity. And a world in which people are searching for that. When people are looking for God, or looking for answers or solutions, when they're looking for peace, one of the places they turn is the church. They turn to us and look for us to do something. And how in these times do we respond? We would hope that the church would be able to take a leading role in calling for peace, in making peace happen, in holding to account those who defy it. Because that is our job. It is not unreasonable that people look to us for this. In this way, we are very much like the pool at Bethesda. A place people come to expect healing. But people also look to other places. They look to places that are not us. They look to governments and NGOs. Increasingly, we look in our crises to lots of disparate places, to communities, to charities, to schools. We look increasingly to solve our geopolitical problems to celebrities. We look all over the place. We look in unexpected places and in ordinary places. What is interesting is that in both of the stories we heard, the person who does the healing is Jesus. Both people are looking for healing. One in a place where it is expected and one where it is not. But it is not the waters of Bethesda that heal our lame man. It is Christ. It is not the waters of Siloam that heal our blind man. It is Christ. That is where the healing power rests. It did then and it does now. As a church, it is our responsibility to make sure that when people look to us to find Christ, to find the healing that Christ provides, that it can be found. It is, un, it is a reasonable expectation that when people walk through our doors or read what we have to say in the media or encounter us in any place that they expect to feel touched by God. But also, in those places where, we should, uh, where people are not expecting us, those places that are ordinary and normal, Christ is always, also, and also sh so should we. We live in a world in which so many need healing. Whether it is individuals struggling with things in their life, whether it is people struggling within ill health, 
whether it is nations or whether it is between nations. We are looking for healing. And when we look for it in our church, we should find it. Because God is here. When we look for it elsewhere, God is there also. We should not shy away from these issues. We should not shy away from anything. We should not say there we do not go. We should not say that issue we do not touch. We should not say those people are not our concern. Because they are Christ's and we are his. One of the central promises of God is full life, is wholeness. It is the central promise that we hold on to. And it is a promise that can be fulfilled for us and through us. It is a mighty responsibility, but it is one, I believe, we are up to. So whether we are looking for God and healing in pools of Bethesda, within our church, within those places we expect, or whether we're out on the margins, or whether... We're just in the ordinary species. We look for God. And look to be Christ. And we look for healing. God is not limited by any of these. And neither should we be. Let us pray. Our Lord... We thank you that you are everywhere. That there is nowhere we can go to escape you. Nowhere we can go that we will not find you. We pray for a world in need of healing. We pray for a world in need of you. We lay it at your feet, our God. The wars and the bombings famines and the shortages, those who are struggling and those who are doing well. All of it we lay at your feet, our God, and ask for healing, for wholeness, for your presence, our God. We pray, our Lord, that you would be with us forever, Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing uh, a hymn which uh, hopefully talks about some of this. Uh, it is Christ's is the world in which we move. It is hymn 724. Um, words are on the screen.
Let us pray. Our Lord, if we were to lay down in front of you all the names of all those who need your touch today, it would be an eternity. Such is the scale of our need. From the small and simple to the life-changing and large, we need you, our God, to intercede in our world, We pray in particular, our God, for tensions, conflict, and war within the Middle East. That you would be in that region. That you would be powerfully working on those who need to make decisions. On those who need to intervene. Put the cause of love above all others in their hearts. Our God, we pray for those closer to home who need your help, who struggle with the systems we have put in place or who struggle with infirmity or frailty, illness or sickness. Our Lord, lay upon our world your healing hands and make it closer to you. Our Lord, be with us also and strengthen us in your love that we may go into the world knowing you more and spreading your love. All this we pray in your sweet name. Amen. We're going to sing our last hymn. Um, Before we do that, uh, I would just like to remind you all that there's tea and coffee and a chance to catch up and chat available over there after the service. But first, let's sing number 466. Before the throne of God above, I have a deep, a perfect plea. 466.
And may the one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, descend upon you, and there remain, now and forevermore.